Hi, I'm Bill Horak from the Brookhaven National Laboratory, and I'm here to talk to you on this chapter on nuclear technology basics. This talk is going to have about six parts. First part, we're going to talk a little bit about Columbia and its important role in the start of nuclear energy, how nuclear energy actually works with an emphasis on nuclear fission, the types of nuclear reactors we have in the world today, and how they contribute to our electric power demand. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about advanced nuclear designs and the role of nuclear power in our future energy mix. Columbia is the place where the first nuclear reactor was constructed in the United States. It was actually constructed over in Poopin Hall by Enrico Fermi and Leo Szilard. Realizing the importance of what they had done, they contacted the U.S. Navy and tried to get a program started in nuclear energy. They were ignored. So Leo Szilard came up with the idea of having Albert Einstein who was vacationing on Long Island at the time to sign a letter on nuclear energy and send it to President Roosevelt, which he did through a gentleman named Alexander Sachs, who was a professor of economics at the time. Roosevelt, recognizing the importance of what the letter said, started the Manhattan Project, which was called the Manhattan Project because that's where Columbia is located. This is a copy of the Einstein letter. In the letter, Einstein identifies nuclear fission as a new power source that not only can be used to make nuclear weapons, but can also be used to power the world. So what is this nuclear energy we're talking about? The nuclear reactors we're going to talk about today release energy through a process called nuclear fission. This is not nuclear fusion, which is the process that powers the sun, nor is it radioisotope generators, which are used mainly in space applications, such as on the Mars rover or on the Pluto orbiter. So in nuclear fission, a neutron, which is a subatomic particle, strikes a nucleus, usually U-235 or plutonium-239, and splits it apart. When it does this, it produces two daughter atoms and more neutrons. The daughter atoms weigh less than the original atom, and we release energy through Einstein's E equals mc squared. We use the neutrons to continue splitting more atoms in what's called a chain reaction. The amount of energy that's released from splitting one atom is hundreds of thousands of times greater from that released by chemical reactions, such as burning fossil fuel. The chain reaction takes place in the core of a nuclear reactor, of which there are many different sizes and designs. The energy released as heat can be put to many uses, from naval propulsion, like icebreakers and submarines, to desalinization of seawater. But we mostly use it in the production of electricity using the same steam cycles as fossil plants, but with no further release of carbon. What is nuclear energy in the world today? How does it contribute? Well, right now, there are 446 operating power reactors in the world. There are nearly as many other types of reactors which are used for research, medical isotope production, or training, including reactors used in naval propulsion. Currently, there are over 50 power reactors under construction, including four in the United States. However, although the amount of electricity generated by nuclear power continues to grow each year, the share of electricity is gradually decreasing because the world demand for electricity is growing even more rapidly. Furthermore, several countries have decided to phase out nuclear energy or reduce their dependence on its generation, further decreasing the share of nuclear power in the world. Right now, the most common type of reactor is what we call a generation two light water reactor. We call it a light water reactor because it uses regular water composed of hydrogen and oxygen, as opposed to what's sometimes referred to as heavy water, which uses an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium, which has an extra neutron in it. And we use that to slow down the, the neutrons so that this chain reaction can occur. There are two main types, pressurized water reactors, where the water pressure is kept high enough that it doesn't boil, and boiling water reactors where the water is allowed to boil in the nuke reactor. They have advantages and disadvantages, but they're about the same in terms of cost and safety level. About two-thirds of the reactors are pressurized water reactors, about one-third are boiling water reactors. Uranium fuel is in pellet form, and it's placed in long rods, which are combined in hundreds of large bundles, which are cooled by the water. These designs require what is referred to as low enriched uranium, which raised the U-35 levels to about 5 to 6 percent instead of the 1 percent that occurs in natural uranium. We do this because light water 
absorbs too many neutrons for a chain reaction to occur. Because enriching uranium is a complex and expensive process that can also be used to make nuclear weapons, some countries have developed alternative designs that use natural uranium that don't use light water. This is a map that shows the location of nuclear power plants in the world, both operating and under construction. As you can see, most of the operating reactors are in the Western countries, and most of the construction is in Asia, particularly China. The country with the largest number of reactors is the United States, with 99 currently operating, which provide about 20% electricity generated in the U.S. France is the country with the largest share of electricity generated by nuclear at 72%, but it seeks to diversify its fuel supply and wants to reduce this to about 50%. Japan, because of the Fukushima accident, went from 40% nuclear energy to zero. It is now starting to put its nuclear plants back online, and it's currently back to around 5%. Several countries have nuclear power shares over 25%, most of these are in Europe. China currently generates about 4% of its electricity from nuclear power, but that number is expected to increase dramatically by the year 2020. What are some of the uh, characteristics of nuclear energy that make it attractive for a sustainable energy future? First off, the life cycle carbon emissions are very low, comparable to most energy technologies. The nuclear plants have a very high power density, meaning that they have small land areas, can be sited easily, and require little fuel transport, unlike fossil plants like gas or coal. Each pellet is equivalent to about several large solar panels. One uranium fuel pellet contains the energy equivalent of one ton of coal. Equally important, the electricity can be dispatched to the grid on a predetermined schedule, unlike renewables, whose output is more variable. In many markets, the price of nuclear energy is competitive with other sources, especially in respect to renewables and coal. Nuclear power also promotes energy diversity, reducing dependence on fossil fuel imports, or conversely, as what's happening over the United Arab Emirates, increasing the amount of fossil fuel they can export to other countries. Finally, unlike many renewable technologies, nuclear energy provides a low carbon heat source for desalination and district heat for nearby cities. Now, the low carbon benefit of nuclear energy has been the subject of some debate in the literature. There's been a large number of life cycle analysis done on the greenhouse gas emissions for different technologies, including nuclear. Because of different assumptions made in these analysis, the results are different. In 2013, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory published a study of studies to resolve these differences. NREL reviewed over 2,000 published studies on electricity generation. They compared the published results and the harmonized results. In other words, they adjusted the results and assumptions to ensure a consistent set of methods and assumptions were used. As can be seen in the graph, the median results for nuclear power using both published and harmonized results are much lower than advanced fossil fuel technologies and comparable to all renewable technologies considered in the study. Nuclear power also has several risks. Although the overall safety record for nuclear power compared to other energy sources has been good, there have been several severe accidents, most notably at Chernobyl and Fukushima. Although the direct loss of life in these accidents was low, the indirect health effects, economic, and ecological effects were quite high. Economically, nuclear power is facing difficulties selling into certain electricity markets, leading to the shutdown of several nuclear power plants in the United States. Moreover, the large capital costs and the need for variable generation capability to better integrate with renewables in the grid make nuclear less attractive. There is also the problem of nuclear proliferation, since nuclear technologies, such as enrichment, can also be used for weapon purposes. Finally, the current use of nuclear fuel, using what's called a once-through fuel cycle, may not be sustainable beyond a few hundred years. Moreover, this once-through cycle leads to increased production of spent fuel and increases the size of the needed repository for long-term storage of nuclear waste. New designs are being developed and deployed today to address these risks. Most of these are what we call Generation 3 Plus designs, which are being constructed and put online now. These designs are evolutionary in nature and, like the current fleet, mainly pressurized water reactors. However, they contain passive safety features such as gravity-fed cooling systems that don't require power, and core catchers, 
which would have mitigated the severe accident at Fukushima. They are also designed for flexible power generation instead of being optimized to run at full power. This enables them to integrate better with a grid that is tied to variable renewable energy sources. Digital instrumentation and control systems enable the plant to run safely over a wider range of conditions while allowing for reduced staffing. They are also designed to have a much longer service life than the current generation, which were originally designed for only 40 years of operation. The end result are designs with higher efficiencies and lower costs that can compete with the ever lower cost of renewables well into the future. Following up on them are going to be the Generation 4 designs. While the Generation 3 designs significantly improve on the performance of the current nuclear fleet, the next generation is designed to make use of uranium more efficiently, thereby reducing the production of nuclear waste while simultaneously reducing life cycle emissions of greenhouse gases even further. They are designed not only to be flexible in electric power generation, but in flexible in using heat for other processes such as desalination and energy storage. They have a goal of having increased safety such that the emergency evacuation zone would end at the plant boundary. Finally, they would have increased security by reducing the pathways that could lead to nuclear weapons. One of these Generation 4 designs is the Molten Salt Reactor. Molten Salt Reactor was originally designed and developed and tested at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the 1960s. The design does away with the nuclear fuel pellets and fuel rods used in conventional designs. Instead, the uranium is dissolved in a molten salt, typically lithium fluoride, as opposed to sodium chloride or table salt and pumped through the reactor core. The uranium molten salt mixture is continuously processed to remove nuclear waste products, thereby reducing the amount of waste produced and the amount of nuclear fuel in use. The design can also convert thorium, which is very abundant with over 400 years of supply, into uranium for fission. The design includes a second molten salt loop that can switch from using energy for electricity generation to energy for heat applications, such as desalinization or energy storage. Flexible generation is easily accommodated by varying the pumping speed of the molten salt. In terms of safety, the entire design operates at low pressure and includes a pa passive freeze plug, which permits the entire molten salt inventory to dump passively into a series of tanks that safely cools by conduction in the earth should power be lost and the system start to overheat. Several firms are developing this design in different versions to enable a wide variety of markets to be served. An alternative to Gen 4 are what are called small modular reactors. These reactors seek to address the same issues as Generation 4 reactors from a disparate perspective. In these designs, the reactors are smaller. They're about the size of 10 megawatts compared to the current generation, but still utilize uranium in pellet form placed into fuel rods and bundles. They are cooled and moderated by light water. However, they're so small that they are built at a central factory and shipped as a fully operational unit to the site. Because of their small size, passive cooling is possible, as is flexible operation. In some designs, the entire module would be shipped back to the factory for maintenance and refueling. One company, NewScale, is now seeking a license from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission as considering building a prototype plant at a site in the U.S. Other countries have expressed interest in these types of plants, especially for remote locations. What are the barriers to deploying these designs? Well, they're high, but they can be overcome because many of them are policy-based. In the U.S., the current law laws only allow for an open fuel cycle in which the nuclear fuel is used once and shipped intact to a permanent repository. Currently, that could only be Yucca Mountain in the United States. Innovative designs like the molten salt reactor have a closed fuel cycle, in which only a small fraction of nuclear waste would need to go to the repository. The current nuclear regulatory framework is focused on large light water reactors. This makes licensing innovative designs costly, with costs of $1 billion or more per design. In some countries, the Generation 3 Plus designs are behind schedule and over budget, highlighting the risks of deploying new designs. Finally, predicting what the structure of the power markets will be over 80 years of, from now is extremely difficult. We know that flexibility will be required if we integrate large amounts of renewables, but will that be sufficient to sell into markets as a merchant plant? While many countries have and states have renewable portfolio standards, only a few have zero emission credits or carbon prices. 
thereby placing nuclear on an uneven playing field with renewables. So then in summary, nuclear energy will be part of the world's energy mix in the future. The IEA estimates that we will need an additional 20 plants per year to meet the two degrees centigrade scenario. However, whether its share generation will increase, remain the same, or decrease will depend on policy decisions that are being made today. Moreover, the industry will have to develop a sustainable nuclear fuel cycle, which includes a permanent waste disposal plant. However, the biggest challenge will be overcoming the confirmation bias of much of the public, which believes that nuclear power is neither low carbon, low cost, or safe.